This is Angela Galloway, and this is Math 146, Chapter 8, which is our Unit 3. This is the second session that I have lecture notes for. Uh, I've already done one for 8.1 through 8.3. Today we'll be starting in 8.4. This whole chapter has been talking about linear equations, and so in the first few sections we talked about um, the different ways we could write out our equation using either standard form or slope-intercept form. We looked at finding the slope, graphing points, all that basic stuff. Now we're going to go a little more in-depth and talk about how we can think of these as functions and look at function notation, uh, look at one variable being the dependent, one variable being the independent variable. And so that's what we're going to go into um, in this section. And then we're, we're able to look at a few more real-life examples when we think of things as functions. So one of the ways we use math is by showing a relationship between two variables. And often one of those variables is going to affect the amount of another variable. So thinking of a very simple example, when we fill up our car with gas, you notice that on the pump the dollar amount of the sale is increasing as as the number of gallons pumped is increasing, right? So as one goes up, the other goes up. This is because the price you pay and the gallons pumped have a relationship. Um, and that relationship is, as you buy more gallons, the dollar amount is going to increase, right? So let's say we let X be, so X is our number of gallons pumped and Y is going to be the price that we're going to pay in dollars. So we could create a linear equation to figure out how much we would pay given how many gallons we purchased, okay? So let's say gas is about 235. Our equ equation would be Y equals 235 times X. Since our total price depends on how many gallons we pumped, the total price, which we called Y, is called the dependent variable, okay, because it depends on the X variable. The X variable, which was our gallons pumped, would be the independent variable. So you can choose how many gallons you're going to pump, and then the price depends on that number of gallons that you chose, okay? And so that's how we can think of independent and dependent variables. So thinking of writing an equation in function notation, when a function f is defined with a rule or an equation using x and y for the independent and dependent variables, we say that y is a function of x, which means that y depends on x. That's why we called y the dependent variable, because it's depending on what you do with x. We're going to use this notation where y is now going to be denoted with this f of x. So we're just saying that y is a function of x. So this f of x is just an abbreviation for writing out function of x, okay? Uh, so in our gasoline example, instead of writing y equals 2.35 times x, we can just write f of x equals 2.35x, because then we're showing that our y value here being gap, being um, the price, um, or the price we're going to pay for the gasoline, um, is depending on what value of x we plug in there, right? So we can read this equation as f of x equals 2.35x, okay? Uh, so this function notation, what I want you to realize is that when we write it out like this, this doesn't mean f times x. You know, sometimes we use parentheses to show multiplication, right? But this doesn't mean f times x. This is just a way of writing out that it's a function of x, okay? So the f is not actually another variable that I'm plugging something in for, okay? It's just talking about that this is function notation. So let's say we want to know how much we're going to pay for 12 gallons of gas. So if we're going to get 12 gallons, that would be x equal to 12 because x is our gallons. If we write this out in function notation, this is how it's represented. We say f of 12. So what that really means is this. We just don't write it out that way. So really we're saying um, what's the function when x is equal to 12? So we don't write out the whole x equals to 12 usually. Um, we just write in the 12, okay? But what that means is plug a 12 in for x. Okay, and so when we write that out, we get $28.20. So this is our function a notation. A linear function should be f of x equals to ax plus b. And so that's very similar to our uh, 
slope intercept form the mx plus b, right? Okay, so something we talk about with the function notation is break-even analysis, okay? Um, break-even analysis is looking at at what point is a company going to break even. So the break-even point is where um, your revenue and your cost equal each other, okay? So when you've made the same amount of money that you've spent, then you could say that you have broken even, right? You're at the break-even point. And then after that point, you're going to start making money. Before that point, you're actually losing money, right? Um, so that's kind of what we think about with break-even analysis. So um, let's look at this example here. Uh, let me erase a few of these marks so we can read it a little better. Okay, so let's say you decide to start a cake business. You're going to work out of your home. So the initial startup cost will just include advertising and baking accessories, and that's going to total $150, okay? So you're going to have to be given this initial startup cost, okay? That would be given to you and your problem. Your average cake costs about $8 to make. Okay, so that's how it's gonna, how much it's gonna cost per unit for us to create something here. You're going to charge $25 for each cake. Okay, so these. Um, numbers that you're given here, you're going to be given those in all your problems. You're just going to have to figure out um, how to put them together to create your equation, right? So the first one says, find the cost as a function of X, which is the number of cakes produced and sold. Okay, so X is how many cakes uh, we're selling or producing. So our cost function, typically we're going to write it as C of X. That just tells us it's the cost function, okay? So that's like our F of X, but you don't have to use an F here. You can use any letter that you want that maybe relates to your problem. So in this case, since we're doing cost, we're using it as a C there, C of X. So we're going to look for what's our initial cost, our initial cost here was the $150, right? So we're going to pay that, the $150 to buy all the pans and um, ingredients and all that stuff that we need to start up with, right? And the advertising. Then we're going to add on $8 for each cake we make, right? So that's what the 8x comes from. It costs us $8 to make each cake. And so based on how many cakes we make, we're just going to do eight times that number, then add the initial cost, and that will give us our total cost to make the cakes, right? So that's our cost function. So both of these functions are going to be fairly simple functions, okay? They're not going to be real long. Um, they're just basic linear functions. So you have the initial cost plus how much it costs to make each of whatever you're making. In this case, it was cakes, um, but it could be anything, okay? So we're just talking about cakes in this situation. Express the revenue as a function of X, the number of cakes sold. So here's our R of X. So for revenue, we use R of X. That's going to equal to, well, what are you actually charging for these cakes? You know, how much money are you going to make? Well, we're charging $25 a cake. So we would say 25 times X is going to give us the amount we're actually going to make on the cakes, right? Okay, so now to find the break-even point here, we're going to set C of X equal to R of X. Because remember, when the cost we, or the amount that we've spent on making the cakes equals the amount that we've made from selling the cakes, then we're at a break-even point, right? From that point on, we'll start making money. Before that point, we're actually losing money. So we're just going to set these two equal to each other. So we'll have 150 plus 8x, which is our cost function, equals 25x, all right? Then we're just solving this for x. So I subtracted 8x from both sides. Once I got to here, I divided by 17, and I get 8.82 equals x. <coughs> Excuse me. So we actually got the answer, you know, 8.82 here equals X. But um, typically you're not going to make 8.82 cakes, right? So we're just going to round up to nine cakes and say once we get to nine cakes, then we'll be, um, you know, starting to make money at that point. Now it says look at the graph of the cost and revenue functions. Okay, so let's look at how we can graph this. Now, we talked a little bit last time about um, using our calculator because it definitely will be helpful to us in this chapter. 
Um, so let's graph um, these two functions. So I'm going to put in my cost function, so 150 plus 8x. And then my revenue function. Okay, and let's graph that. Here to graph. Okay, so at first the graph doesn't look like doesn't look like much to look at, right? <laughs> so um, all you see here is uh, you see a little bit of a line. That doesn't really tell us much, right? So what you could do first, um, if you're not already in Zoom Standard, which I think I am, but I would go to number six, okay, just when you're graphing in general. What Zoom Standard does is it takes you on the x-axis, it goes from negative 10 to 10. On the Y, it goes from negative 10 to 10. So usually, that's a pretty good view of your graph. In this case, it's not really because we're going to have pretty large um, values for our cost and our revenue. You know, if we're putting in several cakes um, in there, they're going to be larger values than 10 or 10, right? Um, 10 or negative 10. So uh, we probably need to adjust that. Now, what you could do is you can go to Zoom and you can zoom out. Um, or zoom in depending on what you're looking at um, and that will widen the screen or narrow the screen but for this one um, it's probably going to be easier if we just adjust the window ourselves so if you go to window what this window is this is just telling you what you are seeing on the x-axis okay right now it's showing us all the x values from negative 10 to 10 and all the y values from negative 10 to 10. now do we need negative values not really right um, because we don't want to see when we're making a negative amount of money and we don't want to see um, when we are making a negative number of cakes right that doesn't really make sense so I'm going to set the X minimum and the Y minimum to zero okay so that means I'm going to get a graph that just looks like this right I just want to look at uh, quadrant one up here right I don't really need to know what's over here or here or here I just want this area here so that's what my graphs going to show me right now okay the next thing I want to know is what's the maximum X value I want well, the X are the number of cakes that I'm making, right? So I could just go up to 10, right? I'm like go up to 10 cakes because I know at this point, that's where my break even point's going to be. Um, but you could put anything in there, but I'm just going to put 10 because that's, that's really all I need. Now, my Y value, we want to think about, you know, how much money are we going to be making? Well, if I plug in a 10 for X here, um, I'm going to get 80 in there, right, plus 150. So I'm going to say if I go up to 300, that's going to be good enough um, for my maximum Y value, okay? Now what these SCL means, that's the scale that it's going to go on. So like right now, this is saying it's going to go by ones. So on the Y axis, it's going to have 300 little tick marks, right? Because it's going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever. But if I put in like a 10, then it's going to go by 10. So it's going to go 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So if you have a larger number, you might want to change this just so you don't have so many little marks over there. Um, you know, like we could use 25 or we could use 10 or, you know, if you used 100, then you're only going to have three marks, but it doesn't matter. That's just how it's going to look. It's still going to graph it the same. It just um, will have a different number of marks over there on the left. So let's just do that for now um, and then graph it. Okay, so now we can see it a lot better, right? We can actually see um, the graph, uh, which is good. And so we can see where that intersection is up here, right? But if we wanted to know exactly where that was, like if I hadn't worked it out yet and I just wanted to look at the graph and find that point of intersection, we can do that, okay? We can go to second trace and we're going to go to the intersect there because that's actually what we're figuring out when we do this when we set them equal um, we are just figuring out where do they cross at and that's called the intersection okay so what it's going to ask me now is it says first curve really it's the same thing as first line it doesn't matter you know curve line whatever it's saying where is the first uh, line that we're looking at where the intersection is right so this is my first line and so I just pushed enter this is my second line right so I've pushed on the first and the second and then the guess 
what you're really supposed to do is get closer to the intersection, like this is where I guess it is. Um, but on this one, there's only one intersection, so as long as we hit enter again, it doesn't matter where you hit it. Um, it's going to find that intersection for us, so let's just push enter again. And there we get the intersection. So it says x equals to 8.82, which is the same thing we got. And at that value, we um, have spent $220.58, and we've made $220.58. Uh, so that is what our y value means. So after that point, that's when we're going to start making money. All right, so that is our intersection. So that's how you could find it using your calculator. Um, or if you just wanted to graph them just to kind of see, you know, um, what it looks like, uh, you can do that as well. Okay, so let me bring that down. Let's go on to the next example here. Okay, so that was 8.4. Uh, we don't do 8.5. Um, there is obviously an 8.5 in the book, but we don't have to go through that. So we go from 8.4 right into 8.6. 8.6 is all about exponential and logarithmic functions. Uh, this is very useful because many real-life problems, uh, including population growth, uh, growth of bacteria, decay of radioactive substances, uh, increase or decrease at a very rapid rate, so more rapid than what just a linear function would show. Okay, so we need a different type of function to explain data that looks like that. And what we use for that is the exponential function. So exponential functions, what they do is they start out kind of slow and then rapidly start to increase. So that's different than a linear function where the rate of change is the same over the whole line, right? But with an exponential function, it starts out, you know, there's definitely some increase happening there, but not too fast. And then at a certain point, you can tell it just kind of takes off and starts exponentially increasing, okay? So this is how we're actually going to write exponential functions. So we have a base b, and it's raised to some power x, okay? So what's different about this one is that our x, which is our variable, is actually up in the exponent, okay? And so that's a little different than what we've been working with so far. Usually we have, you know, the the x is like mx plus b or whatever. It's just multiplied times something or added to something or whatever. But here we've got it actually up in the exponent. And so that's what's going to make it a little trickier when we start solving um, for that x value. And that's where um, our logarithmic functions are going to come in. Now, world population is a, a big example that we cover in this section, and that's because world population is an exponential growth function, um, and so it's growing at an exponential rate um, right now. Okay, so uh, these are some characteristics of our exponential functions. The graph will always contain the point zero, 01, which is kind of interesting. So you notice on all these graphs, zero, 01 um, is on there. And that is because uh, when any base is raised to the power of zero, you get one, okay? So anything raised to the zero power equals one, and so that's why we get that point zero one on all of them. When B, so when your base here um, is greater than 1, the graph will rise from left to right. So you'll notice like this one is 2 to the x, it rises from left to right. This one is 10 to the x, and it rises from left to right. Uh, when B is between 0 and 1, the graph will fall from left to right. So you'll see here this one's falling uh, from left to right. So that's a 1 half to the x power. Uh, the x-axis is the horizontal asymptote. Now, we don't really talk about asymptotes too much, but what that means is that you can see that all of these graphs um, approach the x-axis, right? So they, they look like they're getting closer and closer to the x-axis, but they actually never cross the x-axis. They can get really, really close to it, okay? So they're approaching x equal uh, or y equal to zero, um, but they never... Um, actually get there, okay? So they're just getting closer and closer uh, to the y equal to zero, but it'll never actually um, get to that. So that's what the horizontal asymptote is talking about. So they will all be up here in quadrant one and two. They won't be down here in quadrant three and four. 
Okay, the most important exponential function um, has the base of E. It is used in growth and decay, compound interest, and some statistics problems. Uh, so we have already seen this. Uh, if you remember back in Unit 2, uh, we had this formula. If I can write it out here. Okay, remember we had this formula. Um, when we use this formula for continuous compound interest, uh, the E, we use the E here, which we talked about a little bit back then, and it's raised to the power of RT. So this would have been thought of as like our X value. And so this would be an example of an exponential function. So we're going to talk about it again, even though we did look at it back in Chapter 8. So the number E is named after Leonard Euler, and it's an irrational number, which means it never terminates, so it never ends, and it never repeats. So it just keeps going on forever out here, okay? Kind of like um, the number pi. Um, it just goes on forever. So we use E to represent that. Uh, we're going to use our calculator to approximate powers of E, and you use the E to the X key on your calculator. So let's bring that up real quick. Um, you probably remember this from the last chapter, um, but e to the x is up here, right there. It should be above your ln uh, button. And so if we wanted to do e to the second power, we would do e to the second like that, and we get 7.389. Uh, we could do e to the negative 5. And we get that. Okay, so we're just showing that, um, you know, reminding us how to use our calculator to find those E functions. Okay, this is the form uh, that uh, exponential equations can take. So you're going to have some initial value in there uh, times E to the K times T. Uh, if k is greater than 0, there's exponential growth. If k is less than 0, there's exponential decay. Uh, so exponential growth looks like this. It's growing, okay, uh, or increasing. Exponential k decay, it's actually decaying, which means it's decreasing. Um, so it would look like that, the graph would. Now I have a few YouTube uh, videos here that are kind of interesting if you want to watch them sometime. Um, these are not mine. These are ones I've found uh, looking around. Um, this is about carbon-14 dating, so it just kind of explains how they figure out, you know, how old some fossils are using carbon dating. Um, so that's exam an example of exponential decay. It's kind of interesting. This is about world population, which of course we're seeing exponential growth, and it explains a little bit about how um, the world is growing and that uh, kind of stuff. So if you want to watch that, you can. Okay, so what are we doing here? Um, I'm actually, let's see. I was going to say, I think I'm going to come back to that one. But we'll come back to this in a second. Um, it actually needs some information that we're going to talk about in a second, so I'm going to come back to that one. This one, though, we can go ahead and work on. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, the world population reached 6 billion people on July 18, 1999, and was growing exponentially. Uh, by the end of 2000, the population had grown to 6.079 billion. The projected world population in billions of people X years after 2000 is given by the function um, f of x equals all this, okay? So it's an exponential function because it has the x variable up there in the exponent. Now, based on this model, what would we expect the population to be in 2013? And it was actually 7.125 billion. So what we're looking for is, you know, how good was this at predicting what actually happened? Okay, so first we have to figure out what x variable are we going to plug in? Well, look up here. X is the years after 2000, right? So we're talking about 2013. So 2013 is 13 years after 2000. So we'd be plugging in a 13 for X. So we plug all this in and we get 7.161 billion um, people. Okay, and so that was a pretty good guesstimate, you know, using that one, 7.161 billion compared to 7.125 billion. What do we expect the population to be at the end of 2015? 
So again, now x equals 15, right? That's 15 years after 2000. We plug that in, we get 7.344 billion. Okay, when would we expect the population to reach 8 billion? So what we're looking for here is we're trying to solve for x, right? Because x is our time variable in this one, right? So we're trying to find the x value that makes that true. So solve for x. So if we wrote this out, we're looking for when will the population be 8 billion. So we would have 8, 8 is our f of x, right, equals 6.079e to the 0.0126x. Okay, so the first thing we could do, we could divide both sides by 6.079, right? Then we're still left with e to the 0.0126x. So how do we solve that? How do we solve an equation when x is up in the exponent? And that's the problem we have to figure out a solution to, okay? Um, because typically when we're solving equations, we do the inverses, right? Um, if we have something like this, Okay, if we have 5 plus x equals 6, to solve this, I do the opposite, right? I have an, I've added 5 over here, so the inverse of addition is subtraction, right? So I subtract, and I would get x equals 1, right? If I had 2x equals 4, what's the inverse of multiplying? Well, dividing, right? So I divide both sides. And I'd get x equals 2, right? So here I was adding, so I subtracted because that's the opposite. Here I was multiplying, so I divide because that's the opposite. But here, if I want to solve something equal to e to the x power, how do I get rid of that e, right? What is the inverse of having something um, e to the x power? You know, how do I bring that x down so that now I can solve for it? And that's our issue here, okay? That's what we're wanting to figure out. So let's figure out how we're going to do that. To be able to solve these exponential equations, we're going to use the logarithm, okay? So this is going to be a quick tutorial on how logarithms and exponentials are related, okay? Once we learn about that, we're going to be able to go back to the problem and solve it um, using these logarithms, okay? So let's look at an exponential um, equation. So 2 to the third power equals 8, right? So 2 cubed equals 8. Now in this example, um, 3 is the exponent, right, or sometimes we call it the power, 2 is the base, and then 8 is our answer, right? The exponent 3 is called the logarithm with a base of 2 of 8, and it's written this way. So 3 is our exponent equals log base 2 of 8, okay, so our base comes down here, our answer comes over here. So these are actually the same thing, just written different ways. This is written in exponential. This is written in logarithmic, okay? So the definition of log base b of x is if b to the y equals x, then y equals log base b of x, okay? So it's two ways we can write it. And the reason why we have that is because they're inverses of each other, okay? So if we have this inverse function, then we're able to use one or the other to solve an equation depending on, you know, which one we need. So first, let's just look at going back and forth from exponential to logarithmic, okay? So if I have 4 squared equals 16, what I'm going to do is my exponent goes here on the other side of the equal side, equal sign, sorry. Then I have log base 4, so 4 is my base, just like it was before, and then of 16, so 16 is my answer there. Okay, so I have 2 equals log base 4 of 16. Now, 6 cubed equals 2 16. Again, my exponent comes down here, equals log base 6. So that was my base like before. 
and then 216 um, is my answer there. So 3 equals log base 6 of 216. Now, if I'm in logarithmic equation and I'm going back to exponential, okay, I take my base, and there's my base there, raised to the power of, there's the exponent, right, and then it equals this. Now, this one, I always say, is a little easier to go from logarithmic to exponential because once you get to this, you can tell if it's right or not, right? You just see, well, does 2 to the 5th equal 32, and it does, you know. Um, so you, this one, you can kind of play around with the numbers and eventually get to the right answer, you know, because if I had written it as 5 squared equals 32, well, you would know 5 times 5 is not 32, right? So you would know you'd put some numbers out of order. Going from exponential to logarithmic is a little more difficult because just looking at it, you might not know if that's correct or not. You know, so that's um, what we need to work on is just identifying this pattern, remembering the pattern um, so that you can go back and forth if you need to. Okay, and then an important logarithmic function is the function with a base of e. So since we said we're going to use, um, or we're going to have exponential equations that have e in it, uh, we also can have logarithms with base e in it. And when it has the base e, this is called the natural logarithmic function, which we represent with just ln. Okay, so the natural log. Okay, so ln, that ln button on your calculator here, that's what that ln is for. Okay, that's talking about the natural log. So how do we define that? Well, the natural log of x is equal to log base e of x. Okay, uh, so log base e here is the same thing as natural log. It's just another way of writing it. Okay, so typically we're going to write log base e like this with the natural log. Okay, it's used so often that it has its own special notation. Okay, uh, its own special key on the calculator. Okay, and what happens is when we use the natural log with something that's e to the power of something, then we get that variable back. Okay, so the natural log of e to the k is equal to just k. Why that is helpful is because that's what's going to help us solve these equations that we have. Okay, and so I said we use it to remove the e. So we're not really removing the e, but what we're doing is by taking that natural log, we've done the inverse operation, and then we are left with whatever was in the exponent. Okay, so back to our world population problem. Uh, let me fix this real quick so you can see it. Okay, the problem we had before was um, when will we expect the population to reach 8 billion? Okay, so here is what we had, 8 equals 6.079e times e to the 0.0126x. Okay, so that was um, our equation that we were working with. So the first thing we want to do is remove anything that's in front of the e or added to the e or whatever. Okay, we want to get rid of that. So that's what we did here. We divided by 6.079, and we did that on both sides. Now, don't divide this yet, okay? Just write it out as 8 over 6.079. If you divide it, you're going to get a long decimal, and if you don't keep the decimal to enough places, um, you're going to end up with some rounding error on your answer at the end. So just leave it like this for now, and then we'll just deal with rounding at the end, okay? All right, so once we've done that, now all we're left with is e to the 0.0126x, okay? So when we get to that point, we want to undo that e. And the way we do that is by taking the natural log of both sides, okay? So we take the natural log over here. We're just going to leave that like that for now. We take the natural log over here, and when we do that, it eliminates the e and brings this variable down for us to solve. So now we get just 0.0126x equals the natural log of 8 over 6.079, okay? And then we want to divide everything by the 0.0126 just to get rid of that. And we have just the x left over. We divide by 0.0126 here. And this whole thing is what we're going to put in our calculator. Okay, so we're going to go here, do natural log of 8 divided by 6.079. 
Okay, and then all of that is divided by 0.0126. Okay, and we get 21.79. Okay, that's our answer there. And then it wanted to know what year would we expect the population to be 8 billion. So 21.79, uh, that's how many years after 2000, right? Uh, so that would be at the end of 2021 or sometime in the year 2021. Uh, that would be our answer, right? Okay. So let's do another example here. Um, this one says one of the world's smallest flowering plants is commonly called duckweed and it has a doubling time of approximately 30 hours. The function for the projected growth of this plant is this. Okay, so there's our equation. T is the time in hours. Um, determine the initial population if the population grew to a thousand after 48 hours. Okay, uh, so if it grew to a thousand after 48 hours, the initial population is our y sub zero. Okay, that's the beginning amount. Um, so we're going to say a thousand is what it grew to equals y sub zero times e to the 0 0.0231 times 48 because that's our time. It said in this example our time is in hours. Now remember when we did our uh, when we were dealing with chapter 8, all the time was always in years, right? Uh, but that's not how it is in every problem, okay, when you're talking about other situations. Now, for all those interest equations, yes, time was always in years. Uh, but in other equations, if we're using time, it could be in, in minutes or months or days or whatever. This one happens to be in hours, okay? So we're talking about 48 hours is what we're plugging in there. Okay, so uh, when we solve this, uh, really, uh, we're trying to solve for the y sub zero. So we want to get rid of this whole thing here, right? So if we want, we can just go ahead and divide by that whole thing over here. So 1,000 divided by e to the 0 0.0231 times 48. And that gives us 329.95, which is about 330 plants. Okay, so if we start with 330 plants, after two days, we're going to have 1,000 plants. How long will it take for the plant to triple? Okay, so anytime you're asked how long is it going to take for it to double or triple or to be half, all we're going to do there is we don't know the initial amount and we don't know the ending amount. But what we do know is we're starting with y sub 0, right? That's our initial amount. And if it triples, then the ending amount is going to be 3 times y sub 0, right? Um, so that's all you need to remember is that we don't know that initial amount, but whatever it was, we're going to end up with 3 times that. If we were doing a doubling problem, it would be 2 times that. If we're looking at how long is it going to be for it to be half of the value, which we sometimes do with half-lives, this would be 1 half y sub 0, okay? So um, that's all we're doing there. So what happens is when I divide by y sub 0 on both sides, the y sub 0 goes away, and now I'm just left with 3 equals e to the 0.0231t. Since I'm trying to solve for this up there, I need to get rid of this e, so I take the natural log of both sides. So I'll have the natural log of 3 equals, when I took the natural log of this, it went away, and now I just have 0.0231t, okay? So natural log of 3 equals 0.0231t. All I need to do now is divide by that coefficient there, the 0.0231. I divide both sides by that. And so I have natural log of 3. So natural log of 3 divided by 0.0231. And I get 47.56 if I do two decimal places. And so that would be my answer there. So after 47.56 hours, um, that's when the plant will triple. Okay, and then let's go back uh, to this one we didn't get to yet because now we can do it. Okay, this one about the carbon-14. Uh, the amount of carbon-14 present after x years is modeled by this exponential equation. 
where x is in years and y sub 0 represents the initial amount. What is the half-life of carbon-14? Okay, half-life, uh, it talks about a little bit in that YouTube video I had when they were talking about carbon dating, but half-life is the time it takes for um, half of the initial amount to decay. Okay, so if you started with 100 grams, how long would it take for it to get to 50 grams? Okay. So when we're trying to find that, um, we're looking at, we don't know the initial amount, but we're wanting to know how long would it take for half of it to decay. So we're saying y sub 0 is here, so we're going to be left with one half of y sub 0, right? So we'll have one half y sub 0 equals y sub 0 e to the blah, 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 all that up there, right? Now we're going to divide by y sub 0 on both sides. That will eliminate that and that. Now we're left with this, 1 half equals e to the exponent there. To get to solve this, we have to take the natural log of both sides. So I take the natural log of 1 half equals the natural log of e to the exponent. That eliminates that, right? I leave the natural log of 1 half here equals the negative 0.00012161x. To get x by itself, I divide by this coefficient here and here. And when I do natural log of 1 half divided by this, I get 5,700 years. So it's going to take 5,700 years for half of the initial amount uh, to decay. Okay, so part A was actually harder than part B. Part B, we're not solving for x, we're actually just plugging in a value for x. If an initial sample contains one gram of carbon-14, so that's my y sub zero here, how much will be left after 10,000 years? So I'm going to plug in 10,000 for the t, or for the x in this case, um, and I plug that in. I would put that in my calculator, so in your calculator, it would look something like this. You're going to have 1 times uh, e to the negative 0 0.0001216 times 10,000. The only thing you want to make sure of here is that this entire thing is up in the exponent. Okay, you don't want to uh, close your parenthesis here because that's going to make it think that only this is in the exponent and then you want to multiply by 10,000. But that's not what we want to do. We want the 10,000 up in the exponent, okay? Push enter and you get 0.296 and that would be our um, amount left after 10,000 years. Okay, so if you have time, uh, watch these little videos here. Uh, I think they're... Uh, interesting um, and they're pretty short just a few minutes long so if you have time you might want to look at those that is the end of chapter eight uh, uh, which is um, our unit three so uh, you have eight one eight two eight three and then eight four and eight six uh, for this chapter. Uh, we don't cover eight five. Okay, so even though that's in the book, that's not something uh, that you're required to know for your test or anything. Okay, so if you have any questions, please let me know. You know, you can always email me at angela.galloway at kctcs.edu, and I'll be happy to help. Thanks.